welcome to Long COVID Foundation podcast. This is the channel where we share educational information on Long COVID to help you understand your symptoms better. If you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe button because I can help you to get answers relevant to your symptoms. And don't forget to give a video a like because it tells me that these videos are helpful and at the same time it motivates me to create more content for you. Drop in the comments what are the most worrying symptoms you have experienced with your doctors and we together will try to find solutions. And one of the solutions will be discussed today. So let's jump into our interview. Welcome to the channel and it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Ancha Baranova, George Mason University, who is Director of Chronic and Metabolic and Rare Diseases with research interest in human genetics, personalized medicine, systemic inflammation. Welcome to our channel. Hello, hello, Valentina. And at the same time, I would like to welcome Joachim Gerlach uh, to speak about a developed solution called Vedicinals 9. Based on the information given on the official website, Vedicinals has shown significant results in clinical trials on symptoms that develop during infection and in many cases which persist for months. Uh, so we would be interested in long COVID in particular. Welcome, Gerlach, to our interview. Thank you so much. The format of today's interview will be in two parts. And in the first, we would love to learn more on what is with regards to the main components of this solution. And we'd love to hear details of clinical trials you had and results you have achieved, followed by part two Q&A session. So feel yes. free to start your talk. Okay, so the Distance India is a, a biotech company that is located near Mumbai in Pune, Maharashtra. And uh, we located everything to India because I have a very dear friend there that is now my partner and that I can trust in doing the practical side of things and uh, to get this uh, all into a really high quality and product that will function and work. So the Distance India was established uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, we had now 25 expert teams work for almost two years on meta-analysis, AI-supported research, preclinical trials, toxical trials, toxicity trials, formulation development, pharmacokinetics, bioavailability studies, uh, computational analysis, modeling, clinical trials, necessary compliance, quality control, manufacturing and logistics. So we were quite busy, as you can imagine. Uh, the resulting product, the Distance 9, is classified as a nutraceutical and within India as an adjuvant therapeutic for COVID um, conditions. So that is a different in the legal standing of our product. Um, we started, and especially me personally, on January 24th, 2020, and I called all our teams. I was working before also in, in the sector of uh, environmental health, chronic disease. And so we were connected to a lot of really good uh, scientists in biology, microbiology, and computational science, especially Dr. Sander from MIT. She's running the AI lab there. So she was very, very helpful. And what we needed to know was to get to obtain the ge genomic sequencing of this new coronavirus and compare it to all previous SARS and MERS coronaviruses in order to identify the cold spots. That was the first thing we looked at is how do we, how can we get molecules that are sufficiently proven to work as an antiviral on the unmutated spots like the 3CL protease. True nature of this disease more and more showed, showed up in the reports and we could uh, and became visible and we were able to define the mechanisms behind this multisystemic conditions. So together with our experts, I developed a selection matrix uh, with de defined pathways that we need to address. And then out of that, we could start further looking for molecules that would work adequate. For the reasons of speed to the patient, we referred from any kind of um, allopathic ideas of allopathic drugs. So we, we, we were sure that we have to rely on the molecules that we already knew best, which is uh, phenolic compounds, flavonoids, and dietary supplement components. And because we knew that we would have to come out as a nutraceutical or a, in the best case, an FSMP, if we wanted to be in time, now, we didn't know how long this pandemic would last. And if we want to come to the patient in time, we, we would need a procedure that would, could be done in a year or a year and a half at the, at the most. So in our database, what we were uh, relying on, we had 8,000 molecules that do have, uh, let's say, pharma, uh, pharma, pharmacological properties. 
And uh, so we had to select now according with this matrix that enabled us to select the molecules that would provide coverage of the, as many uh, drug target pathways as possible. And so our next requirement was also to cover the disease overall stages from early onset infection all the way to like prolonged COVID illnesses. And um, the second requirement was also then that you would be able to start supplementation at any stage of the disease because doctors cannot choose when they meet the patient or patients don't uh, always uh, recognize early enough that they're in trouble or they wait too long. You know how that goes. Then there was another thing that is very little known. These natural molecules, especially flavonoids and other phenolic compounds, uh, if the bioavailability is sufficiently enhanced, um, have to shown, have shown that they work on demand. That, that means they assimilate in the chronic ill or in the ill, re, in, the, in the effective region. And it, we don't really know how that works, but the organism decides where it needs these components. So sometimes they, you, you, you see reports, yeah, we didn't find enough in the blood serum, but when you do a biopsy then on, for example, uh, um, arthritis uh, tissue, you find that quercetin is accumulating there uh, and doing, uh, doing the repair job, so to speak. So can you uh, now open the, uh, please the presentation so yeah. that we can have a look at the flow chart because now it gets a little bit more interesting on the details. And these are as symptoms uh, observable by the patient and, and the medical professionals treating uh, these patients. The underlying ongoing organ damage and immune dysregulation and autoimmune conditions and whatever will maybe even develop further if this goes untreated um, is of course another question. Uh, how many people do get long COVID? I think now in Britain you have 1.1 1 .1 million. 1.3 1 million, the recent oh, statistics says, yes. Okay, and, and we count on it that most likely with Omicron, which is highly underestimated, uh, yeah, let's say people don't really get the danger of Omicron because mm -hmm. it doesn't cause severe respiratory illness and ICU admissions, but we think, uh, and I'll come to that later, that it will cause another wave of long haulers because of its genetic um, origin, in, uh, that is one thing, and because of uh, furin cleavage site and its neurotoxicity, but that's uh, for later. So um, I think that the, describing the, 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 uh, the single uh, symptoms, uh, like from uh, general well-being and uh, lung abnormalities, me mental health disorders, and all these symptoms, you know well, I don't think that I have to go too deeply into them. Cardiovascular issues are already also reported now with Omicron in acute Omicron, and they will probably prevail. Now, skin, to skin conditions, um, I have not heard so much from the groups that we are working with. Um, hair loss, yes, I heard that, and it, is, it seems to come, uh, come back after maximum six months to a year. So it's only a temporary problem. Uh, digestive issues, yes, um, that we see also in a lot of long haulers and um, also like an ongoing allergy, food allergies and histamine intolerance, but we get to that also later. Here you see the body regions that are affected, not a complete chart, that is only to give you a rough idea into which organ systems all this uh, displays out, depending on how long it has been ongoing and how severe um, the conditions are triggered. So when does it start? Yes, it can start. It starts practically directly after having acute COVID. And in the next flow chart, when we get to that, I can show you exactly how that plays out in, in, in the, yeah, okay, let, let us get to this one because that is really what is needed to explain everything. Looks a little confusing and complicated on the first glance, but if you will start from the left upper corner, you see the viral phase one and the phase two hypersensitivity phase three hyperinflammation, phase four hypercoagulation. And then on, in the right box, you see time independent, the um, phase five, six and other disorders that are manifesting. And let me start with the acute COVID to make it clear how we think this is coming about. So the viral phase can play out that you have no symptoms or very mild symptoms and the viral phase continues for quite a while and directly causes organ damage, cardiovascular damage, uh, neuronal damage, dysregulations, metabolic disorders, etc. 
this has happened. And I think that also you might have members in your foundation that had non-severe COVID and developed long COVID. Um, if you have a precondition, which many people have and might not even know it, then the viral phase will trigger these and exacerbate these conditions, especially histamine and mast cell disorders. The second phase, if you come from the upper left corner, the hypersensitivity phase mm, is not very well known. Um, and uh, Dr. Chetty has, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, he has proven that uh, beyond any doubt by treating successfully 10, eight or 10,000 by now um, patients, COVID patients. Um, and on the eighth day when they were developing severe symptoms like uh, hypoxia and low oxygen, uh, low, low blood oxygen levels, he would treat that condition mainly with antihistamines and uh, Montelukas, which is a mast cell activation um, inhibitor. And by doing that, he could avoid that uh, any of his patients would need oxygen. They would recover very speedily um, within hours and none of them died. So the hypersensitivity part is grossly underestimated, overlooked and not addressed by 99% of all doctors treating COVID. And also this hypersensitivity phase can continue it does not necessarily have to lead to a hyperinflammation, hypercoagulation. It can also go directly and, and cause long-term organ damage or uh, long COVID conditions. And then the phases hyperinflammation, phase three and hypercoagulation are well known in COVID and actually pretty well treatable and being addressed well. Now, so that is not the real problem. And you can see on the bottom of this chart, you can see a timeline where this all develops. Not even, you cannot pinpoint it exactly on the, uh, on, on the days, but the eighth day is pretty uh, consistent in the reports. And so from there on, you see how all this can lead uh, independently into any of these long COVID conditions that you were observing today. And we are all trying to find solutions for. Um, the viral, the antiviral property of long COVID treatment is being um, a little bit neglected. But we do find um, reports and studies that patients carry um, viral residue or even active uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in their intestinal um, region, in the intestines, or in the central nervous system, in the, in the fluids. So it does make sense to even have antiviral properties, even in long COVID treatment. And the second thing, of course, is that we see in, we come to that also later, Epstein-Barr virus activation in more than two thirds of all acute COVID and long COVID patients. Plus you want to have also something in your hands that is working against the bacterial co-infection and other retroviruses, because it's not only Epstein-Barr, Epstein-Barr is the most prevalent, but we see herpes and other um, retroviruses also being activated during or after acute COVID and, and during long COVID conditions. Next slide. I, I, I want to thank, doc, thank Dr. Chetty and, uh, and Dr. <laughs> Dr. Tina Pierce for their contribution in this hypersensitivity area. Yeah, excuse me, sorry, I forgot about that slide. So here we see the protocol that we are suggesting. So Bidison's nine is, uh, um, con contains nine different um, nutraceutical compounds, natural phytochemical compounds, um, all at a very adequate and balanced dosage and um, with a very high safety profile. The distance was tried in, um, we did I think six or seven different toxicity trials. Um, one was of course the acute toxicity trial with an equivalent of 5,000 milligram per kilo of body weight and it showed no whatsoever side effects or problems in the tested animals. Um, that gives us a classification of a class five um, uh, safety profile. The long-term acute, acute, uh, long uh, high dosage to the toxicity test was over 28 days and also showed the same results. So it is a well-balanced formulation where we have seen in the animal trials and later also in the phase two clinical trials, a very high safety profile 
We do have sometimes some diarrhea being reported. We are not sure if it's from COVID or from the dissonance. That is the only thing we sometimes hear. And what you see on the right side, these are of course additional recommendations that we have uh, worked out with uh, several doctors on how to combine the medicinals. Mm. And we had to do a lot of homework, what is good to be combined with the medicinals. You know that there are many, many different protocols for long COVID floating around. Some of them very unprofessional and we sometimes get to these groups and then they go like with horrendous dosages of niacin and butyrate and other things. And we think this is not professional. You have to test everything. You have to evaluate everything. You have to research everything very throughoutly and well before you start any recommendation. Plus these recommendations we have on the right side also need to be calibrated patient specific. We do have a dosage recommendation, but that is actually not really correct to do because you know that vitamin D and zinc can be also overdosed now. So it has to be measured by a medical professional first and evaluated what is your levels. And according to the patient's levels, this has to be then um, a dosage. What you see there, what else you see there is monolaurine and L-lysine, which we have added as a good measure for the Epstein-Barr activation. They have shown good results in addressing that. Plus on the bottom, that is an example of, an, of a probiotic that has shown really good results, especially for mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerant patients, which are many in the long COVID groups. So we come now to the first phase, viral replication. I, I'll, I'll make it short. During the clinical trials that we uh, did in India, the ethics commission considered it unethical to have a placebo group, which speaks for the Indian um, politics. That means that they uh, will not allow any COVID patient to be untreated in, in, in comparison to what we face here in Europe. And so we were co-administered and the control group that we were evaluated against, they were getting everything that you can find on the planet that is being used against COVID conditions. Compared to the already good treatment there, we could enhance the antiviral property of, um, of patient outcome and we the best thing to measure that with is the cycle threshold from the PCR test and to see how much can you elevate that at average per day. Now, so this is a very clear marker. And so we were able to get that to 1.76 CT value increasement per day during treatment. I don't think that this has been surpassed by any other medication. So here you just see the uh, more technical um, matrix of what kind of targets we are addressing with these compounds. And on the, on the upper part, you see the virus structural proteases, most importantly, of course, the backbone, the three CL protease that is being targeted by all nine molecules, then several other proteases to a lesser degree, but that is enough. If you break the backbone of that virus with nine molecules, that is already a good start. Then the next part, underneath there is the host cell receptors. And that is actually interesting because if you look at the development of this virus, it's mutating and it is showing new proteins, on the, on, especially on the spike on the receptor binding domain. And these new proteins don't only help the virus to evade the antibodies, but they help the virus to attach to other proteins in our host cell, on this host cell receptor. Um, of course, covering ACE2, which everybody knows, but there's another eight in there that you see that are pretty well covered. And that is helping, of course, to, to stand, to hold water against all upcoming variants, because the more host cell, different host cells you block, uh, the less chance the virus has to um, infiltrate into our into our cell systems. So here you see another angle that is a, all the, let's say the cleavage enzymes, the virus needs for cell fusion. As life wants it, these, many of these enzymes are also uh, uh, upregulated in chronic disease, especially for example, like Fourier. What makes this new coronavirus different from all the other viruses we've seen in the past, the gain of function that this virus showed uh, is mainly in the Fourier cleavage site. So that is, that makes it unique amongst all other coronaviruses. And the furin cleavage site is uh, the best target if you want to slow down viral replication and further spread in the body. So 
what we did is uh, very early in the development, we, we were looking for the strongest um, foreign inhibitors available on the planet. And in, that is also in there. And then, of course, you have the intracellular replication mechanism that can be interrupted with zinc ionophores. That's what hydroxychloroquine does. Um, we can do that to the same extent with two molecules, quercetin and epigallocatechin. They do the same job reportedly in, in, um, in bringing in intracellular zinc to stop viral replication. I've been working with quercetin and luteolin already for many years because my wife is uh, having a um, MCAS and other uh, autoimmune diseases. And so I was lo looking into how to dampen mast cell activation and how to um, uh, treat um, histamine intolerance and uh, high histamine levels. So that is actually one of the major points that has not been understood by uh, many men members of the medical community. And so quercetin and luteolin have been proven by Yale University professor uh, Theo, Theodoridis, um, over the last decade as being the best mast cell inhibitors, activation inhibitors that are even beating, what is the name of that, chromolin, by far, in its ability to, um, to bring down mast cell activation, which is fueling this hypersensitivity type 1 allergy that we see in acute COVID, and that is prevailing in long COVID. And um, on the, on the bottom here, there you see that also many of these molecules work as antihistamines, H1 blockers. And then we have a, another pathway that, that is the B cell activation. Um, that is another upstream pathway because the B cell activation will um, finally also excrete IgE, which is causing also this kind of conditions. And then you see also the little um, bugger of Epstein-Barr virus on the bottom. And also there you see, we already have some reported um, Epstein-Barr virus activation inhibitors in the mix. So the monolaurin and the elysin is only just to really make sure because we take that problem very serious. So the Epstein-Barr is doing two things. SARS-CoV-2 infection activates Epstein-Barr activity in, in the cells which results in a higher expression of ACE2, which is the known receptor for the SARS-CoV-2. So that means like SARS-CoV-2 activates Epstein-Barr, Epstein-Barr up up regulates ACE2, and ACE2 invites more coronaviruses to infect the cells. So these are two partners in crime. The second thing is that you can see here, there are several studies on that, that the, uh, during long COVID, we have 66.7 at average like two thirds of long COVID uh, sufferers or long haulers having elevated EBV teeters. Titer I can't emphasize enough to not forget about this angle and include that in the treatment protocols. A simplified charts that we took from our clinical trial report because the report is a little, a lot of volume. So to make it visible for everybody. So the anti-inflammatory part, phase three hyperinflammation, uh, you can measure how well um, a therapeutic is addressing that by looking at interleukin-6. And you see these bars and they are, uh, in some of the biomarkers, you have four bars, others you have less. But in the important biomarkers, we took them like uh, on onset uh, of, uh, at the start of the clinical trial, then on day five, on day 12, and then on day 45. So we were the first company evaluating a product, not only for acute COVID, um, efficacy, but also monitoring the patients uh, until 45 days after the trial, just to see how well can we keep these biomarkers and the, um, uh, let's say, the detrimental mechanisms at bay in uh, not only stopping disease progression, but also to bring the patient to recovery. And you can see that very well into looking six days down to the ground all the way to this C-reactive protein, another marker for inflammatory conditions also is very well down. Ferritin shows the same. And then the one, the TNF alpha, that is from an animal trial, but you can see also that the, the all nine molecules together with this one, there shows pretty good results. Here you see the different mechanisms and there are more. We are just not able to document everything. It's uh, um, not possible. But you see that the most important interleukin-6, uh, other pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, TNF-alpha, 
and, and another large list of cytokines are reportedly being suppressed by, um, by the DISNOS-9. Many of the pathways are not only right on target or uh, downstream managing symptoms. Uh, like for example, if you raise nerve two, that is like an upstream switch for all other cytokines to be released and uh, for inflammation to come. So they are, we are always trying to go upstream as far as possible in our approach. Now, so you can see for raising nerve two was, an, was another major priority in selecting the comp compounds. Yeah, not all these pathways were, uh, were top priority when we started off. We had like 15 to 20 that were a must, that the molecules must cover that. And the rest now is nice to have. It came in for free and it, uh, and it showed really to work well in that composition. So after the uh, hyperinflammation phase, we are looking at the hypochoronic ovulation phase and trom uh, thrombotic conditions. These are also ongoing in, in long COVID in many different ways. And nobody has really yet understood fully how during acute COVID and long COVID, um, all these different uh, thrombotic conditions occur. We just came from the um, therapeutic point of view. We found maybe 15 to 20 different pathways that lead to these thromb uh, thrombosis or microthrombosis conditions. And many of these molecules had been researched on that um, for various reasons, as, as a replacement for blood thinners, um, and also in the hope to develop blood thinners that are having less risk for bleeding or uh, are causing less, less prolonging in, in bleed, bleeding. So here, as a, to make it short, you can see that during the clinical trials, the D-dimers uh, were well kept at bay, while in the control group, the D-dimers were even strongly rising. So our treatment group was having the D-dimers in a very good level. And uh, so that means there was not much uh, blood clotting to be observed. That is one thing where we, um, a warning, we have a lot of long hauler groups and we usually ask them to send us a, a list of supplements or medications they are taking before we even send out the medicinals that ends up with the doctors and, and, and us. And we have to say that there is a lot of things people take that are um, very dangerous for causing bleeding and um, without knowing it. And so we just had a patient report from France, very knowledgeable person. And his doctor found that his platelet count was dropping very, very low. And, um, but he hadn't taken the distance yet. So I was like, I said, what else are you taking? And it was like the black seed oil that he took a huge amount of every day and was not aware of that problem. So he had to stop everything for, uh, for a week or two now before he can resume any other supplements again. So be aware of that. And we always tell doctors, please not to mix any uh, anticoagulants together with the dysnos because that is really dangerous. It's not necessary. So if you, uh, if you take the dissonance, you, you, you better not take any other blood thinners with it because we don't want anything to happen. Here you see, the, you see some of the pathways uh, that are important and that we, uh, we cover with these molecules. And um, as you can see, it's different um, um, mechanisms. There's a thrombin formation, platelet aggregation, um, fibrin formation. And then you see another one that is the second from the bottom. Yeah, that, that is really important for long COVID, is the, the red cell plasticity and deformability. What does that mean? During COVID, acute COVID, and especially during long COVID, uh, several months after, um, the Max Planck Institute in Germany has developed a special machine to look at the blood in these fine capillaries. And so at high speed, they are sending it through there. And then they found that the plasticity was, uh, was gone. So the, the red blood cells become rigid and they lose their deformability. And that will of course prevent them from going through the fine capillary uh, system. And that is not good because of course it will uh, deprive you of oxygen in your cells and it will uh, provide, uh, uh, deprive you of nutrition and also of uh, taking out garbage from your cells. So that's a very de uh, important pathway and uh, fortunately, many of the um, molecules are, have shown to do that, that they restore this plasticity. So here we get now to a very uh, astonishing result. Um, 
is not only to stop disease progression and, uh, and stabilize the patient, but during the trial we had in our group, we had a pretty high number of uh, patients with abnormal lung x-ray findings, which normally are called ground glass opacities or um, other lung damages. And so after 12 days, the diagnosis was uh, repeated and, and we could see a 75% decrease after 12 days in lung abnormalities that is proven, proving that the idea of including senolytics and um, compounds in there that will restore organ tissue is also not only a theoretical scientific assumption. You can see it now on these results that it really plays out very well. Many doctors um, also later in other patient settings couldn't believe what they saw. And they were doubting their, um, uh, their, their equipment. And so that was a very big compliment for us. So here you see an animal trial. We did this trial before we went to uh, the human clinical trials in order to see two things. Um, so the, the first um, task was to see how well does medicinal nine components together work against a um, artificially induced myocardial infarction. And so this was done. And then we used the same opportunity to see if we could increase the bioavailability um, of this suspension. And the best way to prove that would be to show how well can it protect heart muscle tissue from a myocardial infarction, which is a very prevalent problem. And so you can see the upper picture shows you the heart muscle after this trial, untreated, and below you see the treated. And it's pretty obvious even for untrained scientists that there is a huge difference here. We tested two different kinds of versions of medicinals and the bioavailable, more bioavailable version was showing significant better results. So it showed that the hard work on formulation and calibration and uh, reducing molecular size and getting other uh, tricks in there to enhance bioavailability was showing good results because that is the biggest critique on nutraceuticals. Everybody says, ah, they're not bioavailable enough and they won't do the job. And so we sometimes have doctors asking us, is this really a natural um, molecule or that that must be synthetic? Because it works so strong and so fast. But here you can see for yourself how it can prevent heart muscle damage. And so we tell many of our clients, especially in India, to take the dissonance early to avoid heart muscle damage, because that is something I, I think nobody can repair that. And you can measure that with a, also with a troponin level. And you can see that in the medicinal treatment group, the troponin level was uh, down by two thirds compared to the untreated group. So that is another marker that is from the clinical trials on the CPK. Also, that is a marker of uh, muscle damage. And um, it shows that it uh, was well, well, well controlled by Vedicinus 9 um, in the Vedicinus 9 treatment group. So here you see the documented um, properties of these molecules. We couldn't prove that all. We don't have the kind of resources to go for another five or six clinical trials. But many of the studies we took into consideration to uh, help to document what these molecules can do are, are human clinical trials. So these molecules are very well known for uh, the possibility to, to really help in not only myocardial and lung uh, tissue protection, but many other organs as well and also to restore these, these organs, or at least um, parts of it. So that is really a, um, a suspension that can help to, to recover and, bring the, and help the body to heal. Something else that is also playing a big role, I think, even in long COVID, is um, intestinal inflammation and something um, related to, to, to nutrition and to, to, the, to our diet. So we see that many of the people that have chronic uh, autoimmune diseases and chronic um, intestinal inflammation, etc., that is caused by by processed food and food that contains a lot of uh, agrochemicals. And um, I've been researching that for years with many experts. And so you you see that the tight junctions, that is the the cells between the epithelial uh, layer in the in the guts, are being broken and blown off. And so that will cause hyperinflammation. 
and it will cause also hypersensitive cause cause also allergies and so many of the food allergies the high histamine levels and the mast cell activation syndrome especially in women is actually triggered by that and if you are a long hauler you should emphasize on looking at this angle and um and if you need some information we can provide you that how you can help to um to bring these problems also down they play a big role yeah there is another angle to covid and that is um in my opinion leading to many of the uh, fatigue syndromes and neuropathies and whatever we can we can observe and so the the spike protein has a has some prion like domain and it is if that fuses with a uh, with with neuronal cells trigger interactions that are like alzheimer like conditions and amyloid aggregates and prion like diseases and this kind of thing so i learned that from my from my teacher dr senef who has done a, a extensive research now into the neuronal angle of uh, bike protein so we emphasize that a lot and so in the, on the next slides you will see all the pathways that we are covering with the molecules on the on the cytoprotective side of uh, against neuronal damage and so there are many angles so for example the um the spike protein is talking also to to one protein called PLS1 which is part of the tight junctions but not only in the epithelial but also in the endothelium and mainly in the blood brain barrier so many people are underestimating how much neuronal damage covid can do and so we emphasize in the selection of the molecules um that we can cover that as good as possible what is one of the main points that we really were happy to find is that many of these molecules can restore the myelin sheet which is strongly being affected by inflammation inflammatory cytokines and the virus itself and so many of the conditions you see in the extreme cases like gillian bar syndrome and other neurological uh, pathologies are um, are myelin uh, diseases then you see that there is another section that is prime formation i don't think that this is playing out right now in long covid but i think that this will play out in the mid to long term it will be a huge problem now we see that already alpha synuclein is is being upregulated and many other um pathways are being triggered in this um, respect and also the um, another interesting angle is the philopodia adhesion and the um development of philopodia between the cells also since tia formation that has been reportedly brought down by these molecules so there is an array of very very many different neurological pathways that are occurring and i think playing out in long covid so that you want to address this maybe even over a longer period because that will not be able to be restored in a week or two if you ask my opinion if we can restore it at all and then of course you see on the bottom the restoring the blood brain barrier integrity that there's something else uh, playing into this um apart from the diets that you should observe um we've been working with the experts in emf radiation for many years now and um especially professor martin l paul from washington state who is i would say the most renowned expert on these topics in the world and for example has been proven beyond any doubt that if you have a lot of wifi radiation your blood brain very integrity is compromised it breaks open the same does uh, sars cov2 infection and the same does also is happening in long covid so you want to have some nutrition nutraceutical com compounds that can can be helpful in there and for example quercetin is one of the best documented natural molecules to restore tight junction integrity and so that is really an, an important thing plus we always uh, emphasize to reduce mobile phone radiation whenever you don't need it switch off the wifi if you can use a cable for your computer uh, do that um put your telephone on flight mode when you go to sleep all these things help another thing that's why melatonin is in the in the treatment protocol all these kind of environmental factors plus having long covid especially in elderly um patients will of for sure reduce their natural melatonin levels and melatonin is actually one of the best 
um, agents, hormones that we have that can um, help to re repair neuronal damage and to, and to bring down inflammation. So melatonin, either by supplementation or production in your own body is very important. So Wi-Fi or mobile phone radiation is directly um, going, is impairing your pineal gland and your melatonin production. That has been proven. And so all these things, live healthy as good as you can, avoid bad food, stay away from radiation, take some uh, uh, well done uh, nutraceuticals, and then you will see there will be some results. You, you know, a patient shouldn't expect um, to be healed if he's not willing to give up things that made him sick in the first place. Now that's my humble opinion on that one. Yeah, so now we're getting to the metabolic disorders that are showing in, in the long-term damages of uh, COVID conditions. Hyperglycemia, that has been well reported like any, so it, it, apart from directly damaging the pancreatic beta cells, uh, COVID-19 can also lead to diabetes 2 through other metabolic disorders within the cells. So these molecules have been researched for many decades already now to treat diabetes 2 and these kind of metabolic disorders. So there is more than enough evidence to say this is what they probably do. And then we come to the next pathway where I'm a little bit lost personally because it's so complicated that I have a difficult time to wrap my head around this is the immunomodulating pathways and also the um, immuno immunological dysfunction that we see. Now, so we, some scientists even say that SARS-CoV-2 is something like an airborne, airborne AIDS. I don't think it's that bad, but it's getting in that direction. And so a lot of the uh, documented long COVID uh, conditions can be also caused by these kind of, uh, let's say, pathways. The T cells, Th1, Th2 balance that needs to be addressed that is being well documented for these um, molecules and also in our clinical trials we could sh uh, show some good results on the different uh, immune cells their ratio and their uh, and their number another thing that plays into this whole thing is bacterial co-infection and biofilms that sounds strange at this place but it is if you have a, a functional immune system you will have bacterial overgrowth and it's not so much the bacteria that's giving you a problem if you look at uh, the gingy bacteria or uh, Staphylococcus bacteria. The problem is their biofilms that cause even autoimmune disease like Alzheimer's or uh, arthritis. So it's good to keep them at bay. Um, then um, another really important uh, pathway and that is mTOR inhib inhibitors, uh, the macrophage polarization. And then there are two on the bottom <laughs> you might like. Bruce Patterson, we have to thank him for pointing that out. So Dr. Bruce Patterson has shown the persistence of SARS-S1 subunit protein in the CD16 and monocytes in post-acute uh, PASC or long COVID, up to 15 months post-infection. He is treating that by, by two different kinds of um, medication angles. It's the CCR5 or in, uh, inhibitors or antagonists and the uh, CX3CR1 fractokine pathway. And I think that is really a, a sensational finding from his side. And it's not that all long haulers have that, but I think, again, uh, quite a part, quite a big part of the long haulers are suffering from this uh, monocyte activation. We do have some compounds that are reported to be useful in this direction, um, uh, especially for the CCR5. Uh, because we were having that as a main priority at onset of development, because CCR5 happens to be the target molecule to be blocked against HIV. So HIV infection goes through CCR5. And we were a little bit nervous about these reports that the SARS-CoV-2 had some components or has some components of HIV, like GP120, GP141 in it. And so as this was an ongoing debate during the phase of our development, we thought like, let's be safe and put it in there for God's sake. So that if, if that is true, we are not having a big problem later. And so that is why we can cover this, um, I think to a sufficient degree. Yeah, so that is um, an, a, 
a little honor from our side to Dr. Philip McMillan, who has proven in some of his papers that we are facing uh, an autoimmune disease actually with long COVID or even acute COVID. But let's say the, the, the long COVID is, is more uh, to be classified as an on or developing autoimmune disease. So we have to treat it as that. And so I'm not really sure on what to do in that respect, uh, what else to re recommend. We are in ongoing research and uh, discussions with Dr. Philip McMillan. And so I will keep you updated um, on what is happening on that front. To explain a little bit why me personally, I'm a little concerned about Omicron. Everybody else says, oh, it's mild, no problem. Nothing will happen. Nobody's in the hospital. It would be like a natural vaccine. What I found was in the beginning when Omicron was first reported and we could see the, um, the, the building plan of Omicron, um, that the main mutational part of it, or one of the main parts was the Furian cleavage site, which I explained earlier, was now enhanced three or four times. And I found that other study that Furin, the Furin cleavage site uh, plays a key role for the coronavirus to pass the blood brain, brain barrier. So it, it is to be expected that Omicron goes more into the brain and does more neural damage and also will cause, hopefully not, but it might cause a lot of more long COVID cases. Plus it is a direct descendant from the alpha variant. Strangely enough, um, the precursor for Omicron was the D614 alpha variant that was prevalent in April last year. It disappeared and then showed up in November with 30 mutations on its back. Something to worry about because if you, I don't know, you know your patients better, but how many of your patients are mainly coming from the alpha variant, from the early variant of COVID-19 illnesses. And how many have come in recently from Delta? I've taken Dr. Chetty's comment on his observations in South Africa. And uh, you can see that he is uh, reporting some, not in all patients, it will never be in all patients, but you know, people are, some people are more susceptible for these kinds of conditions. And so uh, he was reporting CVST, um, neuropathic pains, tingling, different uh, points in the, in the, in the spiral column, triggering different neurological problems and uh, lots of fatigue. My, my daughter was also telling me headaches, fatigue, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, pain all over the body, muscle pain. And so Omicron, in my opinion, we have to keep an eye on it uh, and, and see what really comes out in the long term. But I would say to leave it untreated is not a good idea, if you ask my opinion. Yeah, I think that was it for today now from my side to give you a, um, a quick rundown to our scientific work and how we developed all this. Thank you very much. That was really amazing presentation, lots of detail. And uh, I will have just a very simple question from patient's point of view. Because yeah. we all studied, for example, curcuminoids. We know that quercetin works, that you know, some of these compounds are great uh, for one or another symptom. But simple thing, all these nine components, can they be taken separately? And the dosages that you've put, can they be taken separately? And will they have yes. the same effect? Probably not, um, because we have been, it took us, five months to, um, we, we did a lot of more animal trials by co combining different ones and seeing the effects on, uh, on different, uh, especially interleukin 60 and alpha and other, in, mostly on inflammatory conditions with, with the animals. And there were so many surprises, just like changing the dosage a little bit from one or other and the, the different combinations. So, and having, you have to have the right raw material. We went you don't believe what we went, how far we had to go to get the right raw materials. And then analyze the raw materials, molecular size, do HPLC analysis, then get, get them dissolved well, get them get the bioavailability to the point now that it really works. 
yes, you can be lucky. If you buy supplements and you take them all night, it will have some effect. Yes, sure. But it will not be the same like, like having a, a well, well proven and tried and developed product. No, and so another little one note to make that uh, there was recent research talking about microclots developed by Risa Pretorius uh, from <laughs> South Africa. Her lab discovered that there are significant hyperactivation on platelets in blood. So basically D-dimer doesn't show what is really happening in terms <laughs> of clots as a note to, to consider for future to, to have maybe deeper analysis on coagulation of your patients in the future. Yes, I, I think that if, if, you, if you look at the literature for the single components, and if you look at the, uh, like I said, like 20 to 25 different uh, coagulation and thrombotic pathways, and they have been all tested extensively on that, we don't get all this information and nobody's spending millions and hundreds of millions of dollars looking at natural molecules uh, from the nutraceutical industry. These, all these trials have been done to look at nature, look at the molecule and then copy it and patent it, uh, have a chemical product, uh, like a synthesize it. We don't claim that we can cover everything. That's not possible for one product. What we do, we can provide a baseline um, to rebalance all these different systems in the body as good as possible. And of course, then it's up to the medical practitioner to say, okay, we have still have a problem here. We still have a problem here. We see that with other uh, doctors treating long haulers. Um, then sometimes they do have to add some uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical or allopathic drug and do some interventions here. We also have patients that you cannot help anymore because next thing is what kind of conditions did people have before they had COVID and long COVID. So okay. to expect that you take now a nutraceutical or some other inter intervention and it will resolve long COVID plus what you had before. Now you have to also differentiate a little bit. If you had already uh, an autoimmune disease or like, for example, women, you have, I don't know how many million in England, but I would guess like at least two or three million uh, women with Hashimoto thyroiditis, which is a autoimmune disease, especially hitting women. And so that means you have mast cell activation, you have high histamine levels, you might not even know it. You get COVID and then you for sure get long COVID. Yeah? And then you suffer and nobody knows why. And then you, you take some medication that doesn't address that specific problem. And then you think, yeah, it doesn't work, but it's so complex. It's a real challenge now yeah, for. So basically, covering uh, what you just said, from very early on, we had uh, publications just giving some clues that virus can persist. Uh, did you try this solution in terms of viral persistence? We could not do that anymore. Look, we, asked, we, we were like, after we finished our clinical trial phase two, and we, did, uh, we went out to the market, we had now several thousand uh, patients, especially in India, also during the last big wave taking that. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell everybody to to take it easy on the customer reviews. We don't even take any more anymore, any of those. Uh, because I said, they were writing, it's a miracle drug, you saved our lives, thank you, my whole family and everything. And I said, okay, but don't talk about this as a miracle drug, it is a good therapeutic. Ancha, do you have any questions to cover from presentation? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do, of course. First of all, that's great presentation. And I think it's a greatly reflect uh, the fully target uh, nature of uh, your uh, compounds, especially given that there are nine different compounds in one bottle and each of them is poly target compound, right? And then you have this poly target over poly target, which is uh, good and bad because one may say there is some polypharmacy which is involved. But before we start talking about polypharmacy, I to cover one very good thing. I'm talking about allopathic medication your medication is allopathic medication it is not an opposite of allopathic medication because pharmaceutical compounds and natural compounds they belong to the same realm of uh, chemical molecules which could be of artificial origin or could be of natural origin so they do all have mechanism and uh, this mechanism could be 
through one target or through pathophysiological process, and your molecules do address pathophysiological processes rather than uh, target compounds, but it is still within allopathic realm and, you know, just out of, uh, you know, good scientific advice, it's, it's better not to go into different realm, which is homeopathic realm, and your drug is not a homeopathic drug, right? So I'm just saying it so you would have less criticism down the line. Allopathic is a good word. Use this word on your side, okay. not on opposite side. Yeah. It's a real good idea. Again, I, I love the idea and you know all those compounds. I saw the list of the compounds you put together. It's like a, a, a classmate photo, yes? A, a picture which I, I've seen many times in different combinations. And this is a very good combination and uh, it is really addressing the causes. But what uh, I would do if I would be you, maybe I would uh, uh, tailor it a little bit because post-COVID is not the same in all people. And some people get more neurology and some people got more uh, thoughts and some people have more fatigue and some more metabolic component, etc. So I would probably try to, for the future, to break it like two three or four combinations, which might have lesser amount of the compounds or maybe have something extra added, right? And tailor them for like particular trials uh, those patients are uh, getting into. And in this way, probably it would be possible to also tailor it to the groups of physicians which are seeing typical patients with typical predominant symptom. So for example, somebody predominantly going to neurologists because they feel that the cause is neurological, maybe slightly more targeted uh, group than, than patients who are having maybe mostly clotting and uh, cardiovascular complications, so to speak. But uh, I mean, I hope that it's not a critique, it's just kind of something uh -huh. really, really uh, which came to my mind uh, and uh, the presentation is amazing uh, and uh, the the work which you did uh, is, is, is really great uh, and I want to see more of it. Yeah, I mean, um, we did some things to this uh, suspension, which we are not talking so much about how to get the bioavailability so strong. So what is possible, um, instead of maybe ripping it apart and giving only some of the components, maybe reduce the dosage a little bit. This dosage is calibrated for normal size weight, 60 plus kilo so maybe it's, it's a good idea to use a little bit less per day than the recommended 50 milliliters and then add some other therapeutics according to the specific disease direction that you want to address to it now that would be also another idea so don't leave it at the full dosage if you think that it might be a problem with people that have a kidney or liver predisposition um, we can watch, we can ask our, the doctors now and the patients to look more for kidney and liver markers um, in the future, in the next weeks and months to come and evaluate that. You are right, it could happen that there is some accumulation. No, nobody can exclude that, but we have hundreds of different of pathways and so many me mechanisms impossible to predict anything in the long run. You have to try, you have to be careful, you have to learn, you have to study. Of course, there is also properties in the same molecules to restore kidney function. Yeah, you saw that on the organ. You can, I, I would send you the slides and have a look at our scientific work. I can have send you also the white paper and the clinical trial data. Have a look at it. It's, a, it's extensive material. And uh, the more you look into it, the more you will like it. Uh, and, the, um, and the kidney and liver damage um, is being also reported to be um, repaired by many of these molecules, depending on what kind of the fibrosis, uh, what kind of damage it is. Yeah, so have, have a look at that. I can send you these uh, different chapters on the white paper for each. Uh, we have one on kidney and liver damage for all the molecules, what has been shown so far in other studies and in the literature. Thank you very much, Joachim, for, for this presentation and taking time to share this information sure. with the Foundation and our listeners. But do not self-medicate. Always consult with your doctor. So exactly. thank you very much for this time and goodbye. Thank you so much.